All right. Uh, good morning, everyone, uh, for waking up at 9 or whatever time it is to get here for 9 a.m. Uh, I know it's early. Uh, it's so early that I forgot to update my slides for, for when I did my uh, presentation. I did this uh, in May as well uh, for Code for Lib. Uh, we're going to talk about managing developer workflows with Jenkins and continuous integration. And my name's uh, Ashok. Um, we'll talk about a little bit about what continuous integration and deployment really is. Uh, we'll also go over what Jenkins is, why you might want to use it, or why you might not want to use it. And I have a little demo at the end of it. And um, if you have questions along the way, just ask. We're a pretty small crowd. Um, so uh, I work at Cherry Hill. We've been doing Drupal for a fairly long time. Uh, we focus primarily on libraries and nonprofits. And um, for me, I like to do work with just automating things. Uh, so you know, we should start off with what is continuous integration. Um, it's really just a way of you know, merging all the work that you're doing along with any other developers into a main timeline. So then you can you know, just make sure that things are working well. Um, you know, like if I'm working on you know, fixing up events on our site, uh, I'm not accidentally um, messing up the work that one of my coworkers might be doing on um, displaying you know, book clubs on our site instead at that same time. You want to try and avoid some of that stuff. And um, with continuous integration, what you're doing is, aside from you know, merging all the stuff back in, uh, you're also starting to do testing of all of that stuff. So then that way, you're making sure that it really isn't broken. Uh, and you, know, you don't necessarily want someone to be going in after every commit and just making sure, hey, my section is working. Is my coworker section working too? Um, that's why you're automating all this stuff. And continuous delivery pushes it a little bit further, like um, because what you will probably end up doing is, you know, as you get bigger and bigger, instead of just having a dev and a production environment, you might have other things involved in the middle. Like you might have a ticketing system, so then you know you push stuff into your dev environment. You might update a particular ticket that goes along with it, or you might send out notifications, and then you're starting to involve other teams. Like, for example, my manager might want to start looking at the site once I've done a deployment into our staging environment. Or the clients might start wanting to look at that at that point as well. So, you know, you're, you're just making sure with the continuous deployment stuff that whatever is going forward is a state that can be deployed. So, like, if something fails, you're not going to be able to deploy that particular build off into production at that point. And the tool we use internally for all this stuff is Jenkins. There, there are a number of other tools that you can use for this stuff, and I'll go over some of them. But um, Jenkins is, it was built for continuous integration software. And, you know, it tests your code, all the changes that you're doing. But it's also evolved into doing managed deployments. Because really speaking, it'll run whatever kind of scripts that you want. And it's, it's a front end to manage how you deliver your, your software or to do other tasks that you need to with your software. Uh, we'll go into that too. And um, it has lots of different kinds of plugins. So like, you know, it, it has plugins for Subversion or Git, or, you know, if you really have to use it, CVS. Um, there's stuff for, you know, uh, integrating it with uh, like Behat or Ant or um, thing for, for testing purposes or deployment purposes. Um, there are lots of notific notification plugins as well. So internally, we have, we started off using email notifications for everything, but we've started using HipChat internally as well. So now we're doing our notifications to the HipChat rooms that we have. And um, if someone's not in the room, then it sends out an email to that person. So we're not ending up with hundreds of emails in our inbox each day. Um, but you can also customize who gets those emails. Like it only goes out to committers or all of that kind of stuff. It's, it's very cool. Um, but there are also reasons why you might not want to use Jenkins. And I'll start with those because, you know, let's get the bad news out of the way. Um, if you're using something like Pantheon or Acquia or, you know, Heroku or whatever, you might not really need to use Jenkins because you're kind of already, well, it's tackling two different kinds of problems. If you're using Pantheon or Acquia or any of these guys, you're 
kind of solving the problem of you know automating your uh, code onto their environments or whatever. So it pushes out, hey, the dev site is automatically updated. I can start looking at it right at that point. But what it doesn't really solve is the testing part of things, or you know, possibly creating new environments or things like that. Um, I, I was talking with the Pantheon folk last night, and they have started recommending their own clients to start um, having a separate server that runs separate server or service that runs some sort of testing tool. So, like, um, there was an article just this past week by a company that. Uh, automatically creates new environments uh, on in Pantheon stack in their dev environment whenever uh, code commits or whatever are done so then people can start testing those specific things out um, and you can do this with Jenkins and all that stuff too and I think Josh is giving a talk on some of that stuff as well um, you might already be using chef or puppet for deployment and but again it's not really solving the testing part of things or the workflow part of things that you might have as part of this. And this, the big part is, or the big reason why people might be scared of using Jenkins is that it doesn't really involve just the actual Jenkins software. Um, you typically have to couple it with your own scripts or you know you have to you have to write some stuff out yourself. So internally we use a lot of Capistrano for doing our deployment stuff and for some of our tests or for just starting off our testing process or you might need to learn Fabric which is Python or or Fing, or, or whatever. You have to learn something new. That's the thing. And it can be scary, especially if you're learning Jenkins along with this, along with your own software that you need to deploy. It's tough, but it's worth it. And finally, the big reason why someone might not want to use Jenkins is because it's Java. Um, I know within the Drupal community, we're terrified of it. <laughs> even though we use stuff like Solar, again, terrifying to just even install it. But um, we have to get over that hump, <coughs> mainly because Jenkins is really good. Um, it it can create test builds for you. You can run tests easily. Um, you can, and then you have the option of automating your deployments or your tests, or you can even make it as easy as pushing a button. So, like, I may write out some code, but then I'm gone for the weekend. My manager might be able to come in and you know look through the site and say, "Hey, this looks good." And then they just push a button, and then it's live. I don't need to be involved in any of that process. I don't need to log into the server. I don't need to do any of that junk. Um, in fact, for this presentation that I'm doing, and hopefully if I do the demo, um, I do not have SSH access uh, to be able to log into our servers to do any of the stuff. Um, I've brought down the code using uh, HTTPS on Git. So. The first kind of people that Jenkins is for is our systems admins. Uh, the guys that, you know, if you're hosting on your own infrastructure, and that's what we do. And um, in our case, we deal with a lot of different kinds of projects. Like we have Rails projects, we have Drupal projects, we have flat HTML projects. Um, we don't have a WordPress project, but I did somewhere else. And the biggest thing I get tired of, or used to get tired of, is people just asking me, hey, can you update the code base? On the server, and then I need to log in, do a git pull, or, or you know, run a, write a cron task, or whatever it might be, and then they'll call me and say, "Hey, it broke." Um, it's really distracting because I'm trying to do my own work, and then, but at the same time, I'm getting pulled over by someone else that needs to do their work. So, I'm lazy that way, and it really helped me. Um, it also helps everyone else. Like, like I said, my manager can come in. He can approve a test build that we have and just deploy it out. Uh, it helps the non-sys admins because we don't need to start creating SSH accounts for people that don't understand the server. Um, they should. It would be good for them to know it, but they don't need to understand it anymore. They can just start viewing their dev site and all the work that they're doing immediately. And um, it's also good for for testers. Like if you have a QA team. You can integrate it with ticketing systems. Like I believe there is a plugin for Jira to be able to, you know, create the new tickets or, and all of that stuff. And if someone says reject, it will stop that build at that point. So it cannot go off into production after that point. And this is a, I guess I'll speak up. So this is a possible, you know, 
workflow of things that you might have. Um, as a user, you'll primarily be interacting through the Jenkins UI. And you know, if you're doing deployments or testing or whatever, it might fire off something like Capistrano or Fabric, or you know, if you're using Pantheon or Terminus or, or, or Chef or whatever it might be. It doesn't really matter. That middle stack is you know, whatever your secret sauce is. And then ultimately you're affecting your dev or production or you know, the multi-dev environments that Pantheon offers, whatever it might be as part of that whole mixture. And you, know, you could even have stick tasks that are affecting both of them at the same time. So then you know, if you make changes in content changes, changes in production, you want to pull them down into dev at some point. You can do all that uh, with a relatively simpler UI. So for my demo, I'm going to be showing the library site uh, that, that we have at Cherry Hill. And um, like I said, for most of the stuff that we have, uh, we use Capistrano for deployments uh, uh, because it helps us do rollbacks or upgrades. It handles multiple servers, all of that kind of stuff fairly well. Um, and the other thing that we're going to do as part of it is uh, after we do a deployment in our dev environment, it's going to fire off uh, and do browser testing at that point. And for this, we're using a service called Sauce Labs, uh, which lets us uh, base, it start it lets us pick whichever um, browser we want to test at, as part of that. So we start testing with IE because you know IE usually gives us the most issues for all this stuff. And um, the other nice thing that Sauce Labs does is it'll um, uh, screen capture the whole thing as a video and a screenshot of all the actions that are occurring. So if something does fail, we're able to start going through and see uh, what happened. And finally, I'll be showing um, a plugin called Jenkins Pipeline, which kind of chains all of the stuff together for us. Assuming I get it working. If it works, then great. If it doesn't, uh, I guess I'll have a lot of questions to answer. All right, so I was testing some stuff out this morning, and what I'm going to decide to do with this is, so this is our, um, the dev version of our library site, and it has a whole bunch of content and whatnot, and what I'm going to decide to do is, uh, you know, as part of a code update that I might be doing by mistake, I just, wait, let me just see which one is which. Okay. Because I want to break it. That's, that's what I want to do. I think we're using the library Zerb theme. And what I'm going to do is just add in a, a rule that hides one of the tabs that we have. Assuming it opens. Sure. Mm-hmm. Whether something has been changed or not, it would push them in there. Okay. But what I think I heard you say is if I hadn't worked on that project for a while, then it wouldn't be doing something every night. Right. And just once there was a change, I would go ahead and push it, and then I could activate it at my interest rather than push it everywhere. Yes. So there are a lot of different ways that you can set up the actual build process. So you could have it be as a cron task if you want, so it runs, you know, nightly at 2 a.m. or whatever you want. Or it could be automated so when there's a git commit or whatever, it does a deployment right at that point. Or you could have it be that it's a manual process. Um, there are various other things that you can do as part of this as well. Um, if you use GitHub, there's actually a page of hooks, and one of them is for Jenkins. Um, 
the, and what it'll do is it'll automatically fire off all the information that Jenkins needs to trigger off a build uh, right from there. And you know that's also true for Bitbucket? Yeah, yes, it is. Right. Yes. Um, at my previous job, that's what we used. And yeah, it integrates really well. Um, at my current job, we use Unfuddle. And again, we have a callback with that that we can do, and it'll fire off that information. All right, so my custom.css file finally opened. You know, I've been coding all day, let's say, and by mistake, I decide I'm not going to show the critical tab. Committed, and I'm going to push it. I don't know if the test will fail with what I did or not, but it'll at least run it. So this is my Jenkins um, site that I have, and in this case, I have two different types of um, views. One is just a default set of views that lets me see what kind of tasks I can run at a given time, and the other one, the more interesting one, is the delivery pipeline which is where things get chained. So basically at this point, I'm running um, a build in my dev environment. And we triggered ours so that we first build out the dev site and then we do our, we, then we decide to do, and do our tests with it. And then we do more browser testing after it. So. One thing that I don't know if people realize that they started because you put your own. Yes, yes, so this part is automated that I have right now. And it's doing its stuff. Uh, it's, I think it's probably finished running at this point. Yes, it finished off. It triggered off a build. And it sent off an email to me and Tommy and my boss, who's probably sleeping and going to be really cranky after this. Um, so as soon as that's done, the second part of my process is starting off the BHAT testing that I have. And if I go in here, I can see that my test is running in BHAT at that point. So, you know, if I had a lot of time on my hands, I could see what's happening in the test in real time as well. Um, today I have time. So, so I can see what's going on. And, you know, it's test started testing off in the browser. Thankfully things are, in this case I'm testing it in Firefox. And because it's Firefox and not IE, I think it'll probably work. Or mostly work. I'm not sure yet. Let's see. And there we go. This test that we have failed. And because it failed, you see these parts here where it shows like a little a little gear for all this stuff? It's not showing up in my production area. I cannot continue with this build at this point because it's failed. So my boss can come in and see, hey, what happened to the build that we were going to do? It's like, I can't do it because you wrote bad code. Fix it. So I come in, you know, early in the morning after a long night at Drupal Camp. I fix it up. Oh, I didn't. This is a big file. I don't know who wrote the CSS file, but it's really big. Okay. Even then, it's, a, it's an awfully big file. When you have 9,000 lines of code in your CSS file, you know something's wrong. <laughs> you know, an old version of IE actually had a limit, has a limit of, um, yes. And I think this particular file actually caused it to break. And that's what I'm remembering now. Yes. Yes. Anyways, so let's 
So I'm going to push it now, and it's going to start doing that whole develop, deployment process again. Actually, I can go back in here, and it should show start showing up in real time at some point. Sometimes it can take a little bit of time just for that push to come over and start doing the build. So, what is the difference between pipeline forcing and pipeline forcing? Are those iterations? Oh, yes. Oh, so it just added 16, right? Yes. Right, so when does it start counting? Um, whenever there's a new, whenever you're starting triggering off a new build process, that's when it's going to be, you know, like in this case, number 16, the next one would be 17. Today. When, will um, or when, will when I do my 99th uh, push, basically. Yes, it always goes up. Yeah. You could. Um, if I go into the configurations for the view, you can tell it specific. I. Yeah, you can tell specifically how many builds you want it to show up at any given time as well. So if I wanted it to show 500, it could show 500, but that's going to be a really long page. Uh, probably more HTML than that CSS file. So it's doing its thing. Whoa, this doesn't show up. I guess it's not done. Oh yeah, this is the other cool part with the BHAT testing. Um, what goes on with it? Whoa, what is going on? <laughs> okay, right, so for that particular failed test that I had, I can see, um, A, I can start seeing metrics on how my, what my tests have done, how they've been doing, all of that kind of stuff, and if I go off to the particular failed one that I had. Uh, let's see. I know I had this somewhere. Yes. Yeah. So within the test results, it'll start showing, you know, where the test failed, all of that kind of stuff. So you can start digging out what happened exactly at that point in here or you can start looking at your sauce lab stuff and you know then see oh I took out an element sorry if I'm jumping a little bit so anyways if I go back to my delivery pipeline now I see that this particular middle one is now green and now finally I can do an actual build off into my production environment yes so two questions one you can automate that Yes, you can do that, or like in our case, this is just like a final check. Since it's our production environment, we don't necessarily want to push it off automatically. Right. Um, this is just an internal decision we made. Um, if you start going down the whole continuous delivery um, list of things you can do with it, you can automate everything. Right. It's exciting and scary at the same time. So um, I'm old. I'm not that bold. <laughs> Uh, it's it's really up to you at that point. So like in our case, like I said, we're using Capistrano and we're just deploying them off to the servers. Uh, but since Capistrano can handle release builds and things like that, if we want to roll back, we have the option to do so. But I know other companies that are using Docker for you know pushing off their deployments or using Chef. Um, there is a really good presentation by the people from Chef, in fact, and how they use Puppet to create their new environment or whatever, and deploy the site to that new environment. Um, the, people the people from Chef use Jenkins as a front end to Puppet to, to spin off the deployment of their sites um, for this stuff. So they'll put their code base within the new VM and all that stuff, and yeah, it's, it's pretty cool. Did I run it? I'm not sure if I ran it. So at one point, might you see 
see in multiple columns there, you had four steps or five steps, or is yes. this screen always the three steps? No, um, it's however complex you want to make your actual workflow With for the stuff. Some representation of your steps. Yes. So a given step, a given column could have multiple steps as part of it. Some of those could be automated, some of those could be manual as part of the whole thing. So like, like I brought in the whole, you know, um, acceptance or rejection of a ticket that you might have in JIRA or, or whatever. Um, that can be one of these steps. And if any one of them fails, then the bill stops at that point. Okay, I don't think I pressed the button. Unless it's not doing a build. No, it is. Yeah. Yeah. But this morning I updated the whole code base, and so it was really out of date for the demo. Um, and that included Drupal Core and all that stuff, and that all got pushed up live. I could have done it during the presentation, but then I wouldn't know how to fix it if it broke. Yeah, so in my case, I'm following the master branch for the stuff that we have. If someone wanted to, they could, you know, if you're using GitFlow or whatever as part of your whole process, um, you know, someone could do their work somewhere else, and then once it's merged back into master and then pushed up, then it'll start building that particular environment. Um, yeah, it, it really, in our case, it depends on how you set up the Capistrano stuff. But like if you're using Pantheon, you know, it could spin up its own separate dev environment for, for every commit that you do or set of commits. Yes? Uh, so how sensitive is the Jenkins installation? So I saw that for, for uh, earlier that was showing up. And I was oh. just wondering like how much of a pain in the butt is it to actually set it up? Is it just dropping in a jar file and running it? Um, it's, sim it's really simple. Uh, if you're using Debian or Ubuntu, app get install Jenkins will do the trick. If you're using CentOS or Red Hat or whatever, yum install Jenkins and you're done. So yeah, you don't even you don't need to download a jar file or anything. It'll automatically set up the accounts, all that stuff on the server for you, and then you can just start configuring things in there. Um, so yeah, now we have deployed our our shiny new code base to. Let's see. To the production version of the site that we have. And the second part of the thing that I'll show in here is uh, just content syncing. I think that's my username and password. So, you know, if we're on a production site or whatever, as time goes on, we're going to be adding more content. We're going to be doing various kinds of things to the site. So, Let's see. I'm just going to change something quickly from here. So, like, let's say we make this one. Drupal can't delay. So our block here shows this thing, but the dev environment is still, content-wise, it's out of sync at this point with what is on production. So the other nice thing with Jenkins is, since you are setting up a chunk of this stuff yourself, really it's up to you for what kind of tasks or things you want to build as part of this. So we, do, we use Drush fairly extensive, and we have a Drush script that will you know, sync up some of this stuff for us uh, behind the scenes. But the client doesn't need to know that. It, it can be anything. And we just have a task that you know syncs the database and files from production to dev. Now I haven't run this in five months. I don't even I don't really know if this will work or not, but it'll at least try. And I think it's running. And oh well, yeah, the nice thing is you can see what's happening with the console output in in real time. 
okay. Now I can see what's happening in real time. Drush does this real weird, funky error for some odd reason. So you find really inter interesting things about Drush or your site when you're running things from the command line uh, this way. So I believe it's just doing the sync. This will take a couple of minutes. Uh, are there any questions in the meanwhile? Uh, I scripted a chunk of this stuff uh, in our case, but I, yeah, so like I said, if you use a hosted service of some sort, uh, you know, they, all, they already provide Drush aliases and things like that for you out of the box, so then you can kind of use that stuff. In our case, since we're doing this on our own environments, we did have to script this stuff out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have one separate CI server that has a whole bunch of jobs for the different sites that we have. And that has, as from there, we are able to log in. It's able to automatically log into the different servers we have using SSH keys and all of that kind of stuff. So that... Is it a VM? Or is it a hardware? Uh, it's, a, it's a cloud server box, so yeah. I think this has completed at this point, and hopefully, if I update the dev site that I have, there we go. We now have Drupal Camp LA on the dev version of the site too. So, for us, like um, like I showed, we do a lot of stuff related to deployment. But we also have different tasks for, you know, if we want to sync down or for clearing caches or for, you know, just very, running various other drush things that we want to run. Like if we want to cache, warm up the caches for a site or whatever, we can do that. Um, we have full control on the box. We have full control on whatever we want to do. You know, we just write up some of the scripts. We present it as a job for the end user so then they can do all of the stuff that they need to do. Um, it frees up my time. It gives them power to do all the stuff that they want. So I think internally it's been really useful for us to have this. And the other thing I'll just put out there, I know it's just kind of my own personal experience. The company I used to work for, they technically don't have a full-time Drupal developer. They have a designer that works on the site. I set up Jenkins for them. I haven't heard from them in a year and a half. And they're still doing code updates, all of that stuff to the site to this day. They're keeping it maintained because I still I just, I just, still see all of the stuff that's going on because uh, they just like to keep me in the loop. And yeah, it's working out really, really well for them. I think that's really it. Yes, there are two questions. Uh, yes and no. Uh, it's, a, it's a tool to help primarily with testing. Now I know with Pantheon it can be integrated so it can spin up all the new environments and things like that. But as far as being a full-blown, you know, tool to, you know, deploy to production or all of that kind of stuff, it's not quite built for that. It's really built for testing. Um, but yeah, like you can pair that up with something like Pantheon if you want to and and do all of that stuff as well, or a chunk of that stuff as well. And Ben? Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so we have, so we'll have, so for our stuff, we have a bunch of Drush aliases files that we'll have that we'll put onto the servers, which are also deployed with Jenkins, so then anytime we do commits, it gets pushed out to the servers we have that way. And also for all of our Capistrano tasks or whatever stuff, Capistrano or Fabric or whatever task that we're building out, 
again, we'll put that in its own version control repository. And again, that'll get pushed out through Jenkins using it. it I'm, we're using Jenkins to push out stuff for Jenkins. So um, yeah, that's, and then yeah, whatever new task we want to build as part of it, it's all there. Um, if you're interested in using Capistrano for some of this stuff, I actually built, uh, I open sourced the, the, the code that we have for this stuff. It's terribly named, though it'll show up in the, um, in the screencast, uh, and it's called Capistrano Drupal Multi-Environment Deployment. So it helps with, you know, if you have multi-sites, it kind of works with that stuff. Um, yeah, and, and it has a whole bunch of different common tasks that we've had to use for our stuff, like doing syncs or warming up caches, clearing caches, all of that kind of stuff. It's, um, it's all there, and it has instructions for how you want to build out your Drush alias file and whatnot. So, yeah, this is what we pretty much use internally to do our deployments and all of our workflow-related stuff. Uh, any other questions? Oh, yes? Um, so in our case, we use BHAT for doing our browser-related testing, and we can, and um, you know, you can use simple tests for doing some of the some of the other testing that's there, as part of Drupal as well. Uh, I know that Greg gave a really good talk on BHAT yesterday, and I think he probably recorded it as well. So I'd recommend taking a look at that. Um, you don't necessarily need to use Sauce Labs. I mean, there's others. There are other tools like Phantom JS or um, something called Gout, which is like just PHP simulation of the browser that can do some of this stuff as well. Uh, and it does its job. It's really quick. Can you give um, an example of what you do test or don't test for? Hmm. Part of it is we just test to make sure that, you know, if we're typing in like stuff into our search box, is it going to the search page and showing up results or no results, things like that. Uh, we're moving into, you know, logging into the site trying to create a node, all of that kind of stuff, just to make sure that some of that core functionality that um, the, con you know, A, the site visitors are expecting shows up, and B, the content engines, what they're expecting for, you know, when they're filling out a form, just making sure that it works correctly, things like that. So when you broke it before the test kind of failed, yeah. was it working for that? So basically, like, it was, on, it was trying to go to the site search, and put in something into this test box. So I hit that particular test box, and since the browser couldn't find it, it said, I don't know what you want to do. Yeah. Um, I forgot to mention it in, this, uh, in these sets of slides, but like, if you're not using Jenkins, you can also look at you know, hosted solutions like, um, what is it, Bamboo? which is uh, an Atlassian product, which apparently is pretty good. It looks a little nicer than Jenkins. Uh, there's also another one called Go, which is written in the Go language. Terrible name, I know, but um, apparently it has a really nice user interface and it's really built for doing some of the stuff with Git. Did you say drone or Go? Go, though there is drone right. as well. Go that's written in the Go language. Yeah, yeah, so if, So go.cd is, uh, is the name of the project. Or go is the name of the project. Go.cd is the, is the URL. That's a nice top-level domain, I'll say that, for this yeah. kind of stuff. But it's still a bad name for a project when you have a language and the tool name the same thing. Um, what else is there? There's Travis CI, which was mentioned, which is more for testing, not really for doing this full-blown integration stuff. Um, yeah. Yes? Yes. Hosted Jenkins, correct? And um, there's another one that's written in Python. I'm trying to remember now. Shoot. I pointed that out to a friend who really hated Java. Um, anyways, the name escapes me, but we have options. Yes? Oh, I don't know why I 
thought it was written in Go. Yeah. It's even more confusing now. <laughs> they should have called that Ruby. <laughs> Anyways, are there any? Oh, yes, Ben? Yeah, the build pipeline. Build pipeline. Themes, there was one, I don't even remember the name of this one. I think it was called the Dooney theme that I was using before. Um, but the Jenkins UI, this is, surprisingly, this is a big improvement from what was there before. Um, as, because this for, for the first time is actually sort of responsive. The previous one wasn't responsive at all. Um, the Dooney theme is a little bit nicer, but it has its own weird quirks. Uh, I'm trying to remember what are the views we've used for this stuff. I think Delivery Pipeline is the main one that we use for chaining our stuff. Otherwise, we'll just list out some of the views that we have, or we'll categorize them so that you know if we're dealing with ta um, if we have multiple sites or multiple applications, each one gets its own little tab up here. So then we can kind of switch back and forth to just see the tasks that are associated with that particular project. Like I think if I, sh I don't know if we should show our, see that, or the one that we have for Cherry Hill, which is hundreds of tasks. Yeah. I just showed this one because it's sane to read. I think that's, if, oh yeah, yes? So, and then just like this is just giving up the URL. Um, it really depends on how you want to open it up. Uh, in our case, all of the people have access to, to log in, but there's also granular permissions for what people can do with things. So like if we have a contractor coming in to help us, they may only get access to see tasks that are you know, for a particular project. They won't see the entire tree of stuff that we have. They don't need to, and yeah, there's no reason for it. Um, it's it's good that way. In our case, yeah, we've password protected it right from from the outside. But if you wanted to, you could show certain jobs at any given point, so then people know what's running. If you want. Yeah. Yeah, that's what I did for the previous place that I worked. They just have a dashboard that lets them know who's working on what, kind of, or who's pushed what. I think if that's it, um, we could talk about questions outside and all of that stuff. But thank you. Uh, I hope you integrate some sort of tool, even if it's not Jenkins, you know, Travis and Pantheon or, or whatever, uh, as part of it, and make your lives easier. At least make your systems admins' lives easier, because we hate dealing with this stuff sometimes. Uh, except for the hard problems. We like hard problems, not SSH problems. Thank you. <laughs>